think it's 7 p.m. We'll get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tejinder Singh. I'm one of the board member uh, with Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, as uh, you, some of you may know, Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, it's the only national wildlife refuge in Ohio based on the western edge of Lake Erie, uh, protecting some of the critical, the most critical wetlands uh, habitats in the world. Uh, this webinar today is part of our Seek the Refuge series. Uh, I will introduce our presenter in a second. Um, but then just for housekeeping, what we'll do, we'll have our presenter, uh, Rebecca Lewis, do her session first, and then we'll take the questions um, at the end. We'll leave some time for question and answer. Uh, I'll also post a couple of links. The first link is essentially giving you more information about Friends uh, Group, for what Friends Group does. And then the second one is an innovation fund. You know, as uh, we have uh, uh, posted on our website, we have something very exciting going on. You know, we have um, cameras, uh, live stream cameras that we are trying to install at some of our locations within the refuge. So you can enjoy the refuge from the comfort of your house. So there's a link, you know, your donation, your membership uh, contributes to getting us these things uh, together. Uh, uh, so this uh, capital fund helps us in putting those cameras in various places at the refuge. So we look for your support there. Uh, and then lastly, I'll put a calendar of events. We have another session coming up on December 7th, where 13 ABC's uh, meteorologist Ross Ellett will talk about uh, the, pat the bird migration path, you know, how weather and climate affect those migration paths, uh, especially in our area. So those links I'll post in a second, but I just wanted to welcome Rebecca Lewis. Rebecca Lewis is uh, our visitor center specialist. She has been with the U.S. Fishery, Fish and Wildlife Services since 1990. And she has also been the state uh, federal, junior federal ducks stamp coordinator for state of Ohio since 1997. If you have been at the refuge, you would have met Rebecca, you know, personally, you know, you know nobody else knows about the refuge more than Rebecca. Uh, and any questions we have on nature, wildlife, or travel, you know, because she enjoys those things. So we always go to her. So I am really thankful, Rebecca, you were able to join us, do talk about the federal and the junior duck stem program today. So I'll turn it over to you. I mean, once you share your screen, I request that everybody mutes um, uh, so that, you know, we can hear Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you to Jinder. There we go. All right, so thank you all for joining and um, I hope that you find this as interesting as I do. I've been boring everyone um, in the office with little tidbits and facts about duck stamps as I have even learned a few things as I was putting this together. So the duck stamp program has often been called the most engaging, efficient, and effective way to support conservation in um, the world. It is definitely one of the most effective government programs out there. And um, we're not gonna learn tonight just what the stamp is, but why we have the stamp, because that's pretty important to um, how amazing the program really is. And I will throw in a few tidbits about refuge history because that's just fun. So we have to go way back to the 1800s. And um, we've all been laughing because only people of a certain age know who Peabody and Sherman are. And apparently I've reached a certain age. Um, but back in the 1800s, of course, hunting was a huge part of how people fed their families and themselves every day. Um, and market hunting became a big business with the peak of the industrial age. Pretty much after the Civil War was when it really hit a peak. And part of that was because of the guns that were now able to be produced. And the boat in the forefront of this picture is a punt boat. And the gun is called a punt gun. And the largest they made had a two inch bore which means when it shot the shot that came out of um, the gun, it was equivalent to 25 12-gauge shells. So that could, um, depending how many birds were in front of the boat, 
could kill 50 to 100 ducks with a single shot. And on the East Coast, canvasbacks were their most desirable um, birds. They brought in $2 a bird. And other birds would bring 2 to $3 per dozen. And then on the Mississippi River, it was mallards that were the most desirable. So with westward expansion, people still needed to eat. They could ship all of these hundreds of ducks westward on rails, and there were commercial ice making plants, so they could keep them cold. And um, restaurants weren't just serving ducks. They were serving robin soup. They were feeding cedar wax wings in different meals. So it was a lot of different migratory birds that were um, being eaten, but ducks were by far the largest mass. So a lot of people noticed, and a lot of the people that noticed were hunters, um, that the duck and the waterfowl um, populations were declining. And they estimated there were 500 million uh, individual waterfowl when colonists arrived. They would cover the, the harbors um, so that you could hardly see the water. There were so many ducks. And by 1900, the estimates were 150 million ducks. So there was federal legislation brought about to protect the waterfowl from over harvest. And one of those was the Lacey Act. The Lacey Act didn't change any specific hunting rules. The Lacey Act made it a federal crime to transport wildlife that was killed in violation of a state law. So if you were in Kentucky and you shot something out of season and then brought it to Ohio, it was now a federal crime. So it just added a little extra layer, an extra um, rule to that. 1913, the Weeks-McLean Act, probably not one most of us have ever heard of. Um, the Weeks-McLean Act made it illegal to hunt waterfowl in the spring. That was actually legal until then, but a lot of, I know the hunt clubs around here had made that illegal long before 1913, but it was a self or not allowed on their lands, um, but it was not illegal to do until then. And then 1918 was the big one, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, that was the treaty with Canada and with Mexico, because these birds are not just birds that belong to the United States. They're migratory birds, they're traveling across political boundaries. And that is the one um, that protects all migratory birds. Um, so no more robin soup after that one, hopefully. So also some of the things that were happening alongside those was habitat protection. And in 1903, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt declared Pelican Island to be the first federal bird reservation. And that was the birth of the um, National Wildlife Refuge System. By the end of his presidency, there were over 50 National Wildlife Refuges, or what would become known as refuges. Paul Kragel was the first manager of that first National Wildlife Refuge, but he was paid $1 a month by the Florida Audubon Society because Congress had not set aside any funds for the refuge, including paying anyone to take care of it. And that's going to be a theme for a little while through our, uh, the next 30 years or so. So even with those protections, with the change in laws, with the start of national wildlife refuges, um, industrialization, urbanization, and wetland loss were uh, rampant. It was happening all over the country. Um, in particular, it was happening in the Dakotas, which have long been known as um, the duck factory of the United States. There is huge duck production that happens up there with um, the, the small, very hot old wetlands and um, duck nesting. So don't get me wrong, I don't knock the Civilian Conservation Corps. You know, this was the Great Depression. They had federal programs to employ people and those programs, this particular, this, the Civilian Conservation Corps, was there to um, reduce flooding and to drain wetlands to provide for more um, agricultural lands. 
So at the same time that the government is paying people to drain wetlands, other agencies are paying to try to protect wetlands. So that, of course, led to another law, the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act of 1934, that um, required the different agencies to actually work together and not um, work against each other. What um, I said, I love the Civilian Conservation Corps. I wouldn't be here without them. My grandfather was a um, employee. I took him to Wisconsin. He drove the bus to bring young ladies from town out to the dances at the camp. And one of them was my grandmother. So all of this was happening and still waterfowl um, population was declining. It dropped from 100 million in 19, um, 1930 to 20 million in 1934. And a huge um, cause of that was the drainage of wetlands and also the drought. This was the dust bowl. And I chose to go with a picture of people instead of the horrors of all of the ducks that were dying due to botulism because if you don't have fresh water going to a wetland, the water becomes stagnant, botulism becomes very common, and then you just lose thousands and thousands of birds. So we are um, now into the Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, administration instead of the Teddy Roosevelt. So he called together three of his friends to create a commission and they produced the Beck report. Tom Beck was a friend of his and then he also asked Ding Darling and Aldo Leopold to be a part of this. And they, their, the report that they produced was science-based. It suggested we need to conserve wetlands, regulate hunting, it forbade the sale of wild game, focused on acquiring habitat, and called upon Congress to appropriate $50 million to buy farmland for national wildlife refugees. They supported all of that but one, and I'm betting you know which one it was. They did not want to provide any funding um, to produce uh, these national wildlife refugees. So these three guys, um, read Tom Beck was, you know, he was, a, he was a friend of the president, but he was the publisher of Collier's Weekly. And you might think, why in the world is this guy on this commission? But he had been the chairman of the Connecticut State Game of Fishing, or Board of Fishing Game. And um, he really did not approve of the Bureau of Biological Survey, which was the precursor to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And he thought it was inadequate, didn't do the job, and he wanted it gone completely. He also thought duck factories were a good idea. And they he literally meant huge buildings filled with incubators, hatching ducks to be released out into the wild. So luckily, luckily for us, Aldo Leopold was one of the other members of the commission. He was an ecologist. He is known as the father of modern wildlife management and um, a college professor at UW-Madison, and he pushed for habitat restoration. He said, we need to have places for these birds to live. And I highly recommend, if you haven't, to read his book, The Same County Only. It's beautifully written. I love to read from it, and it just, it, it talks about experiencing wildlife on a very human level. It's, it's very down to earth. And the other member, um, as I said, was Jay Norwood Ding Darling. And he was a political cartoonist. And his cartoons ran the gamut from you know, knocking politics and taxes and everything. But he really focused on conservation, talking about the overhunting, the loss of habitat. Um, I have a collection of his, his conservation related. Um, cartoons and they're they're very emotional. So he suggested a hunting tax to fund the purchase and restoration of habitat since the federal government wasn't real interested in putting out $50 million. This wasn't a new idea. It's been around since um, around 1912. But he, he, had, he now had a much bigger voice. So between Leopold and Darling, things moved 
forward and the tax was supported and FDR was a stamp collector and he had been his whole life. So he suggested instead of just a tax with a little piece of paper you got, a little receipt that said you paid it, um, to make a stamp. And then in exchange for paying that tax, you had a miniature work of art to celebrate the wildlife that was being protected by it. This is not a postage stamp. It is required to be purchased by all hunters 16 and older. And at the time, you had to attach it to your hunting license. So after that, they also asked that Dick Darling be, um, take the appointment as the head of the U.S. Biological Survey. And he said he would take it, but only temporarily. So he was really only there for a year. Also in 1934, he designed the Blue Goose, which is a stylized Canada goose. I'm sure if you've been to the refuge, you've seen the goose. And it was made, um, he designed that to go on the boundary signs for refuges. Well, um, the company that produced the signs made a note on the order. They could be printed in blue or black, and they have been blue ever since. He also designed a weather vane for one of the refuges in Florida that was in the shape of the blue goose, and that is what the weather vanes on Ottawa's visitor center were modeled after. So what happened with this one little stamp? Um, the one dollar, it was required. You actually weren't allowed to sign it for the, the first year. They made a law that you couldn't destroy it. But after that, you had to sign it to show that it was your stamp. So with that funding source provided, Congress passed the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp Act on March 16th. All funds had to be spent in that year or they would revert back and go to the Works Progress Administration, which employed um, uh, people during the uh, Depression. So Darling illustrated that first duck stamp and it sold for a dollar and nearly 650,000 stamps sold in a matter of weeks. So a fun story about this is that um, he drew some sketches like here, this is what it could look like, or this is what we could do. And he thought he was just making sam samples and he drew them on cardboard shirt stiffeners that he had laying around his office. And the Bureau of Engraving and Printing selected one of those and used it on the stamp. He purchased that first stamp and signed it and gave it to the postmaster. Um, postmaster Mooney sold his stamp collection to George Elam in, um, for $50. Elam sold that duck stamp to Bob Dumain, who will come up later, for $10,000. Bob Dumain offered the stamp up to some dealers for $12,000 and they weren't interested, or to some collectors. So he reached out. He found the top seven stamp collectors in the United States and reached out to them. And Jeanette Rudy of Nashville, Tennessee, bought the stamp for $275,000. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about collecting later hmm. once, once we get through all the hunting stuff. Yeah, Becca, just one thing, you know, um, just wanted to prompt. Um, I just heard that somebody was having uh, audio issues. I wasn't sure if it is widespread. Everybody is able to hear Rebecca okay, right? Yeah, I'm not having any problems, TJ. Okay, okay. Good, because I don't know how to turn my volume up from this end. Okay, no, no. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Thank you. All right. So also in 1934, they hired Jay Clark Salyer, and he was hired as the head of the Division of Wildlife Refuges, and he spent that year driving 20,000 miles, sleeping in his car, and he purchased 323 sites by 1935. So um, by the end of his career, 27 years later, he, they had added 26.5 million acres to the refuge system. And all of this was funded with that stamp money. So I would say that a refuge, appropriately in North Dakota, 
name for him is very important. So these funds are highly restricted. 98% of the purchase price goes directly to acquire and protect wetland habitat and the purchase of easements. So some of it isn't owned outright, um, some of it is um, easements when the other the original landowner keeps ownership, but um, it still protects the wetlands on the, on the property. That other 2% goes back to the administration of the program. And currently that office employs two people to run the whole Dempsey program. So they are not um, wasting a lot of money on this. But it was one of the most effective and efficient. We got to take those wins where we find them. So up until uh, the 1940, and, uh, up until 1949, it wasn't a contest. We all talk about the duck stamp contest and the duck stamp program, but it was just a matter of, that guy's a good artist. Let's ask them to uh, draw the stamp. And in 1945, they asked Bob Hines to draw the stamp. And he was from Ohio, born in Fremont, was hired by the Division of Wildlife, so he then was living in Columbus. And he, he, if you go through some of the old stuff with the Division of Wildlife, you will find his artwork everywhere. It was in the Conservation Bulletin. There are um, duck species um, panels over at McGee Marsh that were done by Bob Hines. I was at a park down in Hocking Hills, and they had... Um, I think it was something about raccoons. And I walked over and I'm looking really close. And my, my daughter was like, what are you looking for? I said, I want to see who drew this. And it was Bob Hines. So um, they asked in 1945, they um, are in, sorry, in 1945, he drew the stamp. In 1947, he was hired by the Fish and Wildlife Service to be the one and only conservation artist the Fish and Wildlife Service has ever employed. His boss was a woman and wasn't happy about it because it was 1947. His boss was Rachel Carson and they became very good friends over time. And he actually did a lot of the illustrations in her books. But one thing he also didn't like was the way that it was run by invitation. So he created the contest and he turned the program into a contest. And um, it is, the Duck Stamp Program is the only art competition sponsored by the federal government. So how effective has it been? Um, this is just the Midwest. You can just look at Ohio. 66% of our refuge property here in Ohio was purchased with Duck Stamp funding. And we have just over 10,000 acres now. Um, 2,500 of 2,500 acres of that is the Cedar Point National Wildlife Refuge, which was donated, and then 82 acres is West Sister, which, as far back as I can find, has always been owned by the government. Um, it's you know it's been a refuge since the 30s. So um, that really of the of the acres in Ohio that have been purchased, it's a much higher percentage than 66. And you can see that some of the other states have far more and far more acres um, that were purchased with duck stamp money. Total across the country, $1.1 billion have been raised and conserved over 6 million acres. Obviously, it did not stay a $1 stamp. Um, it's been raised incrementally through the years, and it's been $25 since 2015, but it really matches with inflation and has crept its way up. This uh, Ready Duck was the first $25 stamp. So there have been some very interesting, you know, it's, yes, it has, does all of this conservation, but it's an art contest, and each one of these is an amazing little piece of artwork. So I picked out some of my favorites, some of my, some of the more interesting ones, some with a little interesting bit of trivia to talk about. 
um, this one. King Buck is the name that was the name of the dog. And every once in a while, a stamp had a little extra message on it. And this one, they uh, put Retrievers Save Game. This was the first and only stamp to feature a dog as um, anywhere on the stamp. And it was from 1959. Maynard Reese was the um, artist, and he was the first to win the contest three times. In 1969, he became the first to win the contest four times. Others have passed him since then, but he was really the leader at the beginning. And this was also the first. I've shown a few of them, and they've all been monochromatic. It's just been one color. And they all, up to this point and beyond, the artwork was done black and white. They've all been just black and white sketches. And sometimes the stamp was printed in color, but it was one color. And this is the first time it was ever printed with multiple colors, and they used black, blue, and yellow. 1961 is one of my favorite stamps because that is the year that Ottawa was created. So this is the, the one that funded a lot of this refuge. Um, it also is one with a little extra message, wildlife, water, preserve wetlands. And this art, the artist for this one was John Ruffin, who I was very excited to see Julia had one a calendar of his artwork in the bookstore the other day because he's from Ohio and um, I've been lucky enough to see some of his artwork. And if you are ever in Cincinnati, I highly recommend you go downtown to see the mural that's by the public library. And this is a mural titled Martha in tribute to the last passenger pigeon that died at the Cincinnati Zoo. And he worked on this mural when he was eight. And it is two stories tall. Unbelievable. And if I ever find some wall space in my office, I will hang. I have a poster of this mural. I'll hang it up in 1970 was the first year that colored artwork could be entered in the contest. And it's Ross's piece one. Edward Byerly. And this was his third contest win. He was the artist. And they were printed in color from this point forward. This one has always been one of my favorite stamps because I love canvas backups. And that is just simply why. It is the only one that's ever featured a decoy as the main um, focal point of the artwork. And it led to a change in the rules that a live duck has to be the main um, focal, focal point of the um, art that's entered. And that was James Fisher from Pennsylvania was the artist. In 1977, the program got a name change. It uh, changed from the migratory bird hunting stamp to migratory bird and conservation stamp. And that was simply an effort to get people who might, who thought it was only a hunting stamp, that that was the only reason and to show people that it has a conservation um, focus also, and there's other reasons to buy it other than hunting. And Martin Merck from Wisconsin with that. Okay. I'm not sure why this one shocked me so much, but I realized, you know, every artist we've talked about was a man. 1991, before the first woman won the federal death stamp contest. Um, and she painted these King Eiders. She was Nancy Powell from Vermont. There have been two other female artists. 2006, Sherry Ma Mine, um, with some Ross's East. And in 2015, Jennifer Miller had already done those. In 1998, they brought, they introduced the pressure sensitive stamp. And in some areas it went over well, in others it didn't. Um, pressure sensitive as opposed to water activated glue. So a sticker as opposed to a lick and stick stamp. 
and it comes on a but um it's it's on a larger piece of paper it's the size of a dollar bill and retail outlets liked it better because it could fit in one of the slots of um, a cash drawer it was easier to do that it was more protected if you have a whole sheet of stamps you have to keep that whole thing flat um if you're selling to collectors there's a whole thing about how you separate stamps that are perforated you do not just, you know, like if you're mailing your stamps, flip, flip, tear, right? Oh, no. You flip it back and forth, creasing it until it just falls apart and separates. And um, those perforations better be even. I learned that the first time I sold stamps to collectors. And I didn't learn it the easiest way. So I had mentioned that this was Rob Steiner from California. And... Um, this stamp, they they marketed them in both ways, both the water activity blue and the um, pressure sensitive until two thousand eight. The two thousand eighteen two thousand nineteen stamp is the last one that has the water activated blue. And the whole reason for that was because of the lack of supply. They could no longer get the paper and the glue that was manufactured in the United States and safe to use. So um, that made a lot of stamp collectors very unhappy. There is so much drama involved in the death stamp program, it's pretty amazing. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. So, you know, anytime there's changes, people get upset. People didn't like that the uh, pressure sensitive came out. Then when the other one went away, completely, people were super unhappy. There were people who had been buying the same page of stamps with the same number for years. They bought an entire page of stamps, um, but it had to have a specific number, and they would come to the duck stamp office and buy it then those are no longer being produced. So 2001, uh, another Ohio artist, Adam Grimm, he was the youngest artist to win. He won at age 21. Before that, the youngest artist had been 21 at 24, and that was Jim Hotman. I have to get my Hotmans right. There's three of them. Um, he was the first who produced, participated in the Junior Duck Stamp Program before winning, and he won again in 2014, so he has won Um, Being from Ohio, we knew him well. We had worked with him with the Junior Duck Stamp, and then we worked with him on his hometown celebration to celebrate his win of the Duck Stamp. And he painted a painting for us um, he kept the original, but he allowed the refuge, um, the friends group, the friends group, to um, produce prints, and those are available at the bookstore. And you've probably seen them sit hung behind the visit of the front desk of the visitor center for years. And we moved it out to the hall to be a little more visible um, last year. So, what do you want to? What do you do if you want to enter? It's not too complicated other than knowing art and being a good artist. You need to portray a um, North American waterfowl species in the scene depicting live birds. No more decoys, no more dead birds in do a dog's mouths. It needs to reproduce well on a stamp. This is one and a half by two inches. So, if it's something that won't show a lot of detail when it's shrunk down, um, it will not be chosen. You need to leave, leave room for the printing. Somewhere on there, they need to fit um, the price and the species and the expiration date. And then you need to get the biology correct. If you have a bird in breeding plumage, you don't put a spring scene 
or you don't put a spider from you know, the Arctic in a mangrove swamp sort of situation. You need to make sure it's in the correct habitat where the bird would most likely be seen. The paintings all need to be seven by 10 and horizontal, no more than a quarter of an inch thick. They can be any medium. They're accepted June 1st through August 15th each year. And you enter, um, there's a form obviously, and pay a $125 entry fee. I say any medium, and I mean it. This artwork is a federal death stamp entry. It's by Rob McBroom, and he he enters every year knowing he will not win. Um, he does it to support the program. He loves the program. He has a great sense of humor, um, and he's just a good guy. But if you want to know about duck stamp drama, look up Rob McBroom, because some of the other artists think he's making a mockery of the program and um, are kind of not very nice to him. So there's been a whole lot of back and forth. And... So each year there's um, a select number of entries that can be, or species that can be painted so that they're choosing from just these. And in 2024, it's these five, but if um, whichever one is selected, you know, put in Merganser, then the other four and one other species will be added for 2025. Um, for a while, they were working to make sure that every species had been represented at least once. So they limited it down. I remember when there were only three available, and then one year it was one. And I want to say that was 2000 with the model stuff, but I could be wrong. So remember how I said they don't like the artists and the, the duck stand people do not like change. Um, under a certain administration in the Department of Interior, they felt we needed to pay tribute to the hunting tradition. And they <laughs> um, put in a rule that within the artwork, there needed to be some sort of hunting element. And um, if you look at the back here, of Mr. this is uh, Jim Hawkins from, oh, 2223, so last year. There's the, um, the duck hunters in the boat way in the back. back there. And in, this is the year before Richard Clifton's stamp, there's decoys floating at the front. And um, if you looked at all of the entries from this year, you would think that that was pretty common, that you just find decoys floating all over the marsh where there's ducks, because that was how a lot of people worked that element into their, their artwork was they put in these little decoys wrapped around something. Um, that secretary left and we don't have that rule anymore. So duck stamps in the media, you don't hear about ducks, you hear about duck stamps in a very small audience and you don't hear about them a lot of other places. So we get kind of excited when they appear somewhere else. I um, told you the story about Bob Dumain buying uh, Ding Darling's first duck stamp. He wrote a book, The Duck Stamp Story. This came out like around 2000. Because I know it was new when um, Adam Grimm had his celebration. And um, so that means it doesn't tell the story of the stamps post 2000. So it, it is a little dated, but it does give you a good story. Um, story about the background. The Million Dollar Duck was a documentary that was done a few years ago, and it followed six artists who enter and are in the program. Rob McBroom, the one that does the very interesting paintings, he is one of those artists. Um, the Hotman brothers are another, are also in there. And um, it's a pretty neat documentary about the program. The reason it's called The Million Dollar Duck is it used to be it was said of the program, if you won, you would make a million dollars off of your rights and, and sales of different products made from your artwork because the artist retains 
reproduction rights for their artwork and the original art. Um, only the stamp is owned by the Fish and Wildlife Service. So that is why it, it's called the Million Dollar Duck. If you're looking for that, do not get confused. Million Dollar Duck is a 1971 classic Disney comedy. And I was very confused when I was looking for a picture of the Million Dollar Duck. Wild Duck Chase is a book that was written by someone who enters the program or enters the contest and uh, tells a lot of the story about how it's not a million dollar guarantee anymore. Who saw the movie Fargo? The, one of the characters in Fargo was a duck stamp artist. And um, the director of the movie or the producer grew up near the Hotman Brothers in Minnesota. So that was where that kind of came from. This character talks about the Hotman Brothers a lot. Um, and I was recently at a art teacher convention and I was promoting the Junior Duck Stamp. And people either came by and said, oh, the Duck Stamp. And they were either young enough that their teachers had taught the program when they were in school or couple said they knew it from Fargo and the rest of them knew it from Tinkoff. So John Oliver did a segment on the deck stamps on this week tonight. Um, that was just a few months ago that he did that. It's humorous um, as John Oliver is, but it was nice to see the deck stamp mentioned in somewhat mainstream media. And it was probably uh, brought about by this one artist. Somebody said, oh yes, I know that from the artist on TikTok. And I thought, wow, there's artists. No, there is an artist talking about the Duck Stamp program on TikTok. And she enters and she shows videos being at the judging, um, talks to different artists and, and did talk about the whole controversy with Rob McGrew. So um, that was a lot of fun. I hope more people, because apparently that's where we learn everything now is from TikTok. So this brings us to the junior duck stamp, which is my favorite part. And it was started in 1989 by a teacher who wanted to teach her students about the duck stamp program. And it spread to a few other states. And the National Art Contest started in 93 where eight states participated. And then Congress recognized the program, created the Junior Duck Stamp Conservation and Design Program Act in 1994. And Ohio started um, using the program and um, having a contest in 1995. And by 2000, all 50 states, District of Columbia and US territories are running a contest. So anybody can do it anywhere. Kindergarten through 12th grade can enter the junior duck stamp program. It can be done individually through schools, youth groups, anybody. There is a full curriculum that includes all subjects. So you can use, obviously you can use science to teach conservation, but um, reading, math, all of that is involved. And it incorporates art and conservation. So your final project after learning about conservation and waterfowl is to produce a nine by 12 inch artwork. It could be no more than a quarter of an inch thick and any medium other than digital is accepted. We are working on a way to accept digital, but we are moving slowly. It has the same judging criteria as the adult contest of federal stamp. Uh, oops, again, any media about the digital. And it needs to be biologically accurate and alternatives to the traditional stamp style is uh, accepted in the privilege. I forgot to delete a slide. I knew something was going weird. Um, so we have a great partnership. We have many partnerships here in the state, but Ohio Decoy Collectors and Carvers Association is one of our main partners. They typically host our judging at their show, which means we are surrounded by waterfowl artists. And um, we 
just like the federal stamp, we have five judges who judge. This year it was Larry Holman, um, an artist, and he's written some or done some children's books using illustrations of birds. Julie owns an art store and teaches classes. Tim, Tim Daniel runs the state waterfowl stamp program and also is in charge of the um, the photo contest that um, decides the draw a blank on the stamps that you can buy for the state that um, supports diversity, um, wildlife diversity. Maybe it's the wildlife diversity state. Andrea is a biologist with the Division of Wildlife and poor Luke here who looks like somebody just drug him out of bed is because we drug him out of bed. Our fifth judge and our alternate both had catastrophes that morning and couldn't make it. But like I said, we are surrounded by artists for that at that um, show. So we actually did pull him out of bed to come down and judge our um, contest that winter. So each state judges their entries and there are 100 pieces of art that are given awards. There's three first place, three second, three third, and 16 honorable mention in each age group. And there's four age groups. Every student, and it's, remember I said Congress created that act, it's in that act. So it's law that every student receives recognition for the entering the program or entering the contest. Each state sends their best of show to the national contest, and then a national winner is chosen. For the stamp. These are just some, a variety of the different stamps that have been produced over the years. Ohio has had three national winners in the Junior Duck Stamp Contest. Um, Christine Clayton was the most recent in 2012. Rui Wong in 2010. Earth just gets me every time. Murky answers gorgeous. And then Lily Spang was from, she's from Toledo, and she won in 2009. But it's not just, you know, obviously this one is not going to win the federal contest, but I love the kindergarten piece of great art. Um, even when it's truly awful, you can tell that the kids saw the parts of the bird that were most distinctive and out of a glob of temper paint on a paper, you can identify a ready duck. And then I get to do an award ceremony and see all of the kids and give them their prizes and their ribbons. And it's just the happiest thing to do here. So at one point we were discussing how do we how do we encourage more conservation in the program um, and not just the art? So we added a conservation message. It's part of their entry form. It is not required and not everybody does it, but if they do enter um, a conservation message, it's judged and every state has a winner of a, conser a conservation message winner. And there is a federal winner. And this was the 2020 um, message. And then that is also the artwork for the 2020 um, artwork. And that is Madison Grimm. If you recognize that last name, her dad was the youngest winning federal duck stand winner from Ohio. Um, but they now live in South Dakota. So that's where she entered. Some questions that always come up about the contest and the program. Um, why, why do not hunters buy it? Why should they? Why in the world would they want to? Um, because it's a, a small investment or a relatively small investment that does a huge amount of good for conservation and or conservation education in the case of the Junior duck stamp. That's a five dollar stamp, and that money all goes back into conservation education. Um, you know, we saw how much of the refuge was purchased with duck stamp dollars, and the refuge is open to the public 359 days out of the year, except when we occasionally have to close trails for 
maintenance. Um, we are only closed for hunting six days a year. And waterfowl hunters do hunt on the refuge 24 days a year. So this refuge, you know, it's, there's sometimes we hear people say, well, hunters paid for this, so they get to use it. And um, well, they do 24 days a year, and the rest of the time it's here for the birds and for you, other people. Not assuming all of you are not hunters. Um, why not a non duck stamp? Why not put a rail? They use wetlands. They're just you know, as wetlands are just as vital to to other birds. It's honestly just because we can't fight tradition or it's too hard. Um, I have seen what happens when the Federal Duck Stamp Office tries to make a change. In 2016, this suggestion was put out to just like adding that hunting element, which was horrible for the people um, receiving all the comments. Adding a non-huntable species was worse. Um, and it just... It's, you know, change is hard <laughs> and we still need to do it, but it just has not, um, it's not been easy on the people trying to run the program. So they've kept it at the status quo, I guess is a good way to put it. Why not a birder stamp? Um, that's been suggested. The state has the wildlife diversity stamp. And stamps like that are known in the stamp collecting world as a Cinderella stamp. And they are just not as collectible because if you sell a million duck stamps, let's say 80% of those are used by hunters. Well, now only 20% of them are in the hands of people that are more likely to take care of them. Um, you know, they're not stuck in somebody's wallet or in their um, flap on their coat or wherever else hunters stick them. Um, so they're, though, you know, far fewer are going to be saved. And that just makes it more collectible. And it, it makes it more likely that the value will go up. If the only reason people buy them is to save them and collect them, their value doesn't really go up. Um, and it often costs more to run a program like that than the program raises. Makes sense. I hope. All right. So that's all I've got. Rebecca, no, thank you. Fascinating. You know, you were saying it's like interesting beyond, um, you know, any other programs we've had, you know, such good information you shared. I mean, next lot of tidbits, personal connection of yours also, like how your grandfather was part of this program, you run this program. So where can one buy uh, uh, this stamp? Can we buy it locally here at our refuge or no? Yep. Um, Julia has both the federal and the junior in the bookstore. Okay. And um, if you're somewhere else, some post offices sell the federal duck stamp. Um, it's pretty rare to find any with the that sell the junior. Okay. A lot, a lot of sporting goods stores sell the stamp. Um, hmm. Oh, they you can order it online, and okay. there is an e-stamp version uh, where they will you get a uh, receipt, and then they will mail you the stamp. Wow. Perfect. Yeah, well, and I know I have one question from Basia. Do you know if there have been duck stamp uh, misprint souls that are now more valuable? I don't know for sure, but I know I read something about it where they check them. Hmm. And so probably. Oh, oh, well. I think Paul had a question also. Paul, do you want to ask? Yeah, I, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the, the duck stamp program's so successful for ducks and wetlands, but are, are there any plans or ideas for more generic wildlife stamps or some way to protect habitat other than, uh, you know, for other declining birds, like shorebirds, grassland, prairie, forest birds? Yeah, 
and maybe even other animals or, or plants too. Yes, they did approve um, spending duck stamp money on upland um, rest of, uh, upland habitat and restoration a couple of years ago. Then, of course, you know, ducks don't nest in the water anyway. They nest in uplands. So that's, you know, even if you are saying this is about ducks and we need, you know, that's what we need to spend it on, um, they need the upland too. So that that was approved a couple of years ago. They broadened what the money could be spent on. Thank you, Rebecca. Yep. Just take looking if there are any other questions. See anyone in there, but I know Laurie just says, you know, great info, Rebecca. Thank you very much. You know, I think this was, oh, there's another question, Paul. Go ahead. Yeah. Can, can the duck stamps be used as uh, like for park entry? Uh, I, I know one time I was in uh, Florida, Cape Canaveral, which is not a refuge, but it's still federal. And uh, somehow I think we were able to use the, the duck stamp for admission. To, to that even though we're like hunting with our cameras <laughs> <laughs> yes so um probably because it keep an emerald but really it's affiliated with merritt island national wildlife refuge and there's some weird overlap in there um yes you can use it for admission to national wildlife refuges and random nasa bases that are overlapped over the top but um, not to national parks, not to any other federal recreation things, just national wildlife refuges. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. TJ and I talked about that at the yeah. beginning. Yeah. <laughs> forgot to talk about it later. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? No. Thank you, Rebecca, again. I know we are almost at time. I uh, appreciate you joining. You know, this was, you know, I mean, you were saying you know, initially, you know, how many people would be interested? I think a lot of people would be interested. The artwork. The only question I have is, can you take a picture and then print it and then submit it or no? Or it has to be an artwork. Like, even though I take a duck picture, can I print it and then submit it or no? No. No. Okay. Has artwork. Best artwork. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. No, great. I think this is excellent, you know, and um, thank you everyone for joining. We have another session uh, on December 7th, but Rebecca, it was just, you know, like I did not know like, so many things. I know how often we talk, but it was so good to hear the program that you run. It's a very successful program in Ohio and nationally also, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Paul's question is fascinating. I don't think anyone will be allowed any AI created entries, no? No. And that is why we're really slowly creeping into offering digital because you, my son does it all the time. He, mm. you know, gets on the iPad and he draws and he's using a pen or, you know, a paper, I mean, a paintbrush or something and he's choosing his color and he's creating it on there. But how do you know the difference? How do you know whether it was AI generated or by a person's my hand man. to a screen? And um, so that's why we have the program at least the junior program has not moved into digital yet. I'm yeah. not sure if the federal could handle that. All right. So we're right on time. We'll close. Thanks, Rebecca. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye.